So thank you to the magnificent rector for this introduction and for reminding me that it's difficult to talk after Prize Nobel and uh, Professor Jean-Paul Fitoussi, a dean of a most prestigious faculty in Italy. Uh, if I didn't remember now, I do. Um, but uh, um, I'll take uh, um, the bar from uh, the presentation on Telecom Italia just to say that we deeply feel the responsibility of being a company of 66,000 people uh, and uh, so it's a big company in Italy and uh, the responsibility especially comes as we work in the most transforming industry of our era and so uh, as much our, as our country needs to be um, taken through this transformation uh, to develop digital culture as much more we feel uh, the role of a relevant company like Telecom Italia to uh, be instrumental to this. Um, I see there is a growing tendency to see the digital economy, or generally speaking, the technology in general, as responsible for the increasing inequalities. I fear the reason for this may lie in the spectacular success of some relatively new businesses, especially of their leaders, who were quickly parachuted at the top of Forbes list of the world billionaires. Bill Gates, for example, founder of Microsoft, is the richest man in the world. Jeff Bezos becomes third. Mark Zuckerberg, 33 years old guy, scores fifth. And their fortunes, by the way, come out of astonishing professional successes, not because of inheritance and the power of compound interest, but they just come out of their values. So many scholars point out that in today's societies, in the Western world, Wealth is increasingly concentrated in the hands of very few. And here comes the infamous top 1% that was also quoted by Professor Stiglitz. That might be true, but when we look at the wider picture, when we look at the world outside the boundaries of Western countries, we see that inequality is not on the rise instead. Never the percentage of world population living in extreme poverty has been smaller, and never the world population has been bigger for this matter. According to the World Bank in 2013, 10.7% of the world's population lived on less than $1.9 a day. And this compares to 12.4% in 2012 and compares to 35% in 1990. So poverty rates have declined in all regions. And when we know, though, that the reduction in world poverty was led mainly by China and India. Half of the extreme poor still live in sub-Saharan Africa, which is something we should never forget. And let's remember that poverty and inequality are two very different concepts. And yet I wanted to begin with these categories on poverty because I think we shall be clear on this point. Our aim should be to eradicate extreme poverty and to open up new opportunities for all people of the world. So we should care about equality of opportunity, not equality of results. Inequality of opportunities is, I believe, quite a cost for the society. As was remember, you cannot choose your parents. So if all kids have access to education, we all may benefit, as some of them may be great scientists or great businessmen. If somebody is old back instead because their parents are poor, we may be wasting talents. But equality of results have been tried over and over and has been a disaster. Equality of results means taking away the incentives to be ambitious, thirsty, and hardworking. We want business to perform and we want individuals to perform, of course within the framework of the rule of law. We need talent and ambition to be properly rewarded if we want to continue to live in a prosperous society. The key, quest the key question to me is then what role the digital economy could play, not so much in equalizing income and assets, but in opening up opportunities for those who lack them. For those who lack them. In January 2016, the World Bank released a report that unexpectedly warned over the impact of technology on social inequality. This report recognizes the short-term benefits generated by the digital revolution, but it also draws attention to the fact that most of these benefits are concentrated in the hands of a few. The problem lies, in fact, 
in the fact that profits are consolidating the well-being of an elite made up of companies and professionals who are highly trained for this new environment, but they are not increasing the well-being of society as a whole. An economic revolution that would benefit just a small portion of the overall population would certainly entail some negative consequences. But is that, I question, really the case with the development of the digital economy as we've seen it so far? I fear we're paying too much attention to the Bill Gates and the Zuckerbergs of this world and their astonishingly new made fortunes and too little attention to consumer and common people all over the world. Take Bill Gates again. Gates' phenomenal success is due to a series of choices, some of them technological, some of them commercial, that in fact led to a pervasive spread of personal computer through the world. Sometimes I pause for a second and I realize that my kids and never seen a typewriter, if not in a museum. How did Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel, for that matter, change the way we work, perhaps even the way we think? And not just Microsoft, and I'm just speaking one, but tech giants, generally speaking, have brought us so many and so diverse other advantages, ranging from increasing firm productivity to broadening access to knowledge and education, while unleashing a whole new set of services without which we could no longer live today. These services have often phenomenally reduced rents and monopoly power into the markets. And just think, for example, about e-commerce. The ability to compare among sellers all over the world has empowered consumers and made very difficult for producers to even attempt to charge prices above the competitive level. In so doing, it has freed resources and pushed for increased efficiencies. And on the top of that, however, the dramatic drop in transaction information and bargaining cost has opened new markets for producers, particularly niche, niche producers in peripheral countries. Go to eBay, which is kind of the word bazaar, and just browse for a minuscule producer being able to market their products at once all through the world. This fact is having dramatic consequences and is also creating new grounds for self-employment and entrepreneurship. We live in the Kickstarter world if people have an idea they consider good and lack access to capital, they can just go online and search for wannabe customers that are also ready to advance them resources in order to begin with production. It's called crowdfunding. And this is a paramount change of traditional model and brings with itself a true democratization of capitalism. And let me also stress for once, this progress has been effectively shared worldwide, far more instantaneously than ever in the past, thanks to globalization. And I think the digital economy is making waves all over the world. The good news is that in the digital world, as customer, we're all created equal. In terms of availability of broader range of products and services, a better quality and often a lower price is such benefits are equally shared among all internet users, regardless of geography, race, or gender. And sure, we should provide digital literacy and internet access to everybody. But again, digitalization has brought a wider democratization of the capitalism. Let's go back on the previous point. The fact that the development of the digital economy has apparently brought about a more polarized distribution of incomes and profit. The rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer. And yet, this is far from being the rule. Not all companies and all sectors being a part of the so-called digital economy are responsible for the income polarization. Software houses, for example, cloud computer providers, internet service providers, industry 4.0, manufacturing fir firms, online banks, distance learning university, institution providing public services online, all play an integral role in the digital economy but can hardly be considered a source of increased income inequality. Internet players, the big ones such as Google, Facebook, Amazon, Uber, Airbnb, may raise a different question. The majority of their assets and employee-like business model is based on matchmaking between vendors, service providers, and customer. And thanks to the network effects, so the value of the service they provide increases with the number of users, they often succeed <clears throat> in making strong profits. Indeed, both the higher profits they earn, but the advantageous continues 
the conditions they get from the vendors, in the case of Amazon, from home renters, in the case of Airbnb, or from drivers, in the case of Uber, on much to what is often considered their economic power. So in other words, getting bigger and bigger creates monopolies. And yet, when it comes to degrees of monopolization, so to say, it is hard to argue that Amazon or Uber or Airbnb have reduced competition in society. By cutting the middleman, they squeeze costs and allow consumers to benefit from cheaper prices. They also tend to be marketplace companies, that is, businesses that create a platform for others to trade, and in so doing, they've cut dramatically the transaction cost. A rather different issue, which is more serious because it questions the effectiveness of our rule of law, is whether the source of the profits that these players turn is tax illusion. Thanks to the global intangible nature of their business, we know internet players can easily move revenues and profits from one country to another, optimizing their tax burden to the detriment of the countries where the customers are, pay are based. I do believe that we can try to control this exaggeration of incomes and profit polarization phenomenon. We can do that by and large relying on market mechanisms. And I think competition policies have a role to play. What we need is that barriers to entry keep low as they are today so that we could benefit from inputs and ideas of new innovators. I think we could also imagine forms of income different from the employee compensation, the traditional wages. This is particularly relevant in the case of data. Data are valuable, but at the moment for companies getting data is like a gold mine with no man's land. They are owned on a first-come, first-served basis. And yet, data are something that users, not companies, generate. And I think this ought to be changed more by the means of a change of public opinion than by the means of the law. It is so hard to imagine that for example, individual could start earning money or any other kind of remuneration, for example, discount vouchers, in exchange for the personal data they submit to digital platforms. By doing so, people would start getting paid from the wealth and value they actively contribute to create by submitting their personal data. A much needed action, though, it is far from being a new proposal, is increasing and fine-tuning investment in education. The digital economy, it's safe to say, it requires more versatile workers than before. This means a more focus on learning how to learn in school. It means streaming our ability to adapt to change. And very frequently now, I hear a proposal for a special purpose taxation for digital companies. One of these last was, again, by Bill Gates, recently that came up with the idea that robots should be taxed in order to help humans keep their jobs. And of course, robots don't pay taxes, except, except when you pay the EVA or VAT when you buy them. A robot tax would be, at a certain point, I think, paid either by shareholders or via increased prices by consumers. Digital innovation and automation help the economy to become more productive and more efficient. So it should be fostered, not hindered. But again, the problem is how do we take the system through transition? So the transition from one, one industrial era to another definitely should be explored through policies because it cannot occur so suddenly. A couple of years ago, in order to stimulate a quicker transition of the Italian economy to the digital world, I proposed the exact opposite of the digital tax. I suggested the introduction of a higher taxation for the analogic or a brick and mortar production. Uh, the, the idea was that uh, we should tax the use of the paperwork, tax the use of services provided in a traditional way, such to incentivize services provided digital. But this is particularly uh, valid when you're talking about services. Imagine the public administration services that should turn digital. So as a conclusion, associating inequality with the overall digital economy entails an oversimplification of a very complex matter. I think that, on contrary, technology is a powerful aid in reducing global poverty and should be at first understood as such. I think, on the other hand, we should remember that the people that suffer most in terms of unemployment, underemployment, or low wages 
are those with the very low digital skills. And I think that to make sure the technology doesn't produce a more polarized distribution of wealth, we have three remedies to suggest. Education, education, education. Thank you.